Isaiah chapter 6. We're continuing a series I just began the Sunday morning. It's, it's really a series that is, um, I think, a little bit difficult to minister on and teach, especially in this generation. And what we're talking about is uh, biblical divine holiness. And tonight I want to build a foundation upon that reality. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah begins in chapter 1, and he works his, all, his way all the way to chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. And in those chapters, he's, he's dealing with the subject of uh, sin in, in the church or in the people of God. And then he gets to chapter 6. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, actually six times he uses the word woe, 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 woe. Uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, we know that when we get to the very end, there's an angel of the Lord that uh, flies across the heaven that says woe, woe, woe. And I did a study one time, and actually I'd like to write a book on it sometime because that word woe, most uh, Greek words or Hebrew words are connected to other words. Uh, but that particular word stands all by itself, and it has the deepest, uh, most painful brokenness that you can imagine. And it's actually God speaking, woe, 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 to the human race. Um, in this particular set of scriptures in Isaiah, he's talking about, about, the people of God, they're in trouble. And they're in trouble because of their disobedience, their rebellion, uh, their sinfulness, their wickedness, their immorality. And then in chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. <clears throat> and his, the glory filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain uh, they covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verse 3, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So we were trying to establish the reality that God is holy. I mean, he is holy. And out of his holiness uh, comes all creation. If God was not holy, pure, absolute holiness, blazing, glorious holiness, um, if God was not holy and he existed, I'm telling you, he, he would end up making the devil look like a Cub Scout. Without holiness, God would end up making the devil look like a Cub Scout because out of that holiness, it means purity, innocence, um, integrity, honesty, anything and everything good. He's the father of lights in whom there's no verb and his father shall have turning. There is no darkness in God whatsoever. So here we are proclaiming holiness in a generation that doesn't, I think, have any concept of holiness. It's actually even hard for us as believers to wrap our mind around holiness. And, but out of that holiness, out of, see, God's character is holy. He, his love is holy. His peace, his joy, his long-suffering, his mercy, his goodness, his kindness, his meekness, I mean, out of everything that God is, he's holy. And a lot of people don't understand that when Christ came to this earth, he came not just to save us, to redeem us, uh, but he came to make us holy like he is holy. That's actually what, because actually that's what man lost in the garden. Adam was holy. He said, let us make man in our likeness and our image and let them have dominion. Uh, you know, if someone gets dominion that is not walking in divine holiness, they can easily become a monster. Uh, somebody can be given authority or power or wealth, and when they're given it, maybe before they're given it, they're okay. And they say money corrupts or power corrupts or position corrupts. That really isn't true. What happens is that what happens, you get put into that furnace, that fire of wealth. It's a furnace. We want to talk about this a little bit tonight. It's a furnace. You get in that furnace. and you, How many know that you can take a chunk of metal and you put it into the furnace and you turn the heat up and the metal begins to mount and guess what comes to the top? Scum. Impurities come to the top. And uh, so what happens if that metal... Uh, 
begins to cool off, though that impurities begins to sink back into the heart of that metal, and it's in the same condition it was before. So uh, if you put a man into a position like King Saul, Saul was a humble man until he became king, and then he, he didn't become corrupt. What happened is the corruptness that was in his heart came out. Uh, it's what we call tests and trials that reveal what we're made of. Uh, so, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that the only one that is completely holy and pure and innocent uh, is God himself. Now, uh, the Bible says that he calls the angels the holy angels. Now, there are holy angels. There's holy men. Isaiah was considered a man. He was considered a holy man. As a matter of fact, it says, For prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Isaiah is a holy man. Adam and his wife were holy until the woman was deceived and she gave to her husband. He did eat. That was his choice. And they lost their holiness. They lost holiness. Uh, and the heart, the Bible says now, the heart is exceedingly deceitful and wicked above all things. Some people say, well, yeah, but I got a new heart. <clears throat> well, uh, you were born again, and we, we, a lot of people don't un exactly understand what happened, what the born-again experience is. Uh, the Bible says we're born of the incorruptible seed of the word of life. When we believe on Jesus, the seed of Christ is planted into the soul of our soul, like a seed into the ground. Now, that seed has got to be watered, nourished. The ground's got to be good. It's got to be weeded, or it will never produce. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many gardens through the years we've planted, and we didn't hardly get anything out of it, you know. I, I was driving down the road, and there's this guy down the road who actually, he buys gold. And every time I go past his garden, going through Fayetteville, I'm a little bit jealous because, man, he's got an amazing, I mean, amazing garden. It just... You know, sometimes I want to stop and just take a look to see if he's got nothing but plastic plants in there. You know, maybe they're not real. You know, but how come he's got an amazing garden? Well, he's doing something we're not doing. Uh, how come some people really are walking with God and they really know God and they really become with one with God and other believers don't because they're doing something that other believers aren't doing? So God is a holy God and this holy prophet he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he hears the angelic beings crying, Holy, 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 which is his character, his nature. Notice they're not crying, love, 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 power, 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 authority, 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 faith, 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 mercy, 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 throughout eternity. They're, uh, right now, this moment in heaven is filled with that wonderful song, Holy, holy, holy. And every time they say it, the, the doorpost... Uh, is shook in heaven. There's doorposts in heaven. And it says, the whole earth is full of his glory. Notice where the holiness of God, the glory of God comes. That's where the glory of God shows up, where the holiness of God is. And the holiness of God is, is not a man-made doctrine, a man-made philosophy, a man-created uh, 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 man lifestyle. It's not. It's not clothing. It's a condition of the heart, and it comes right from the one who is holy himself, which is God. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. That's the glory. That's the Shekinah, the smoke of the Lord. In verse 5, notice, Then said I, Woe is me. Now, we're going to get to that in a moment, woe is me. Because really, <clears throat> tonight I want to lay the foundation for holiness. And the foundation of holiness is maybe not at all what some people think it is. Now you say, yeah, well, Christ is the foundation. Well, he is the foundation of all things. He is the cornerstone. That's correct. But there's something more involved in attaining or possessing holiness. Now, I, I, I've had people say, well, the minute you get born again, you're, concern, you're, you're considered holy. No, you're, concer you're considered righteous. The minute you repent of your sins, you cry out to God, Lord, forgive me, and you're sincere. In the eyes of God, you are righteous. But there is an attaining of holiness because otherwise the New Testament wouldn't talk about attaining holiness. Be holy as I am holy. And, and, and the Bible, you can look up the word holy in the New Testament and it talks about it 170 times in the New Testament. And it's so important that we attain holiness. Now, it, it, but, but holiness is, is such a... It's so far beyond our natural concept, and it's the greatest. I'm telling you, 
other than accepting Christ, other than the Word of God, other than the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is the greatest, it is the greatest aspect of God you and I can ever attain, is the holiness of God. And there's different levels of holiness. So Adam and his wife, they were living in the holiness of God, and all that creation has came out of holiness. And do you know throughout eternity, God's people will be holy? We will be holy like God is holy throughout eternity. And the Bible talks, talks about the holy scriptures, the holy word, the holy Jerusalem coming out of heaven, the holy saints, the holy angels. I mean, holiness is something that God requires of us. Um, now, let's just understand holiness just in one way before we get into the foundation of holiness. Because actually, I, I've discovered uh, there's 14 wonderful, amazing realities that God has provided to the believer to walk in holiness. I mean, you can find it yourself. Uh, but if you look at this particular subject, connected with the word holy, holiness, or holy is the word to be sanctified, sanctification, um, and the word saint. So in order for us to be holy, there must be sanctification or we must become sanctified and that's a progressive work and I'm going to show you how that works uh, there, the Bible talks about purged God wants to purge us or purify us God wants to cleanse us now one of the main ways that God cleanses us how many have ever taken a bath none of you <laughs> we all take right we got to take a bath right so there's a cleansing, there's a purifying, there is a sanctifying, there is a refining like metal uh, in a furnace. Now, gold in, in the world, gold, we have different what we call carats of gold. 24 carat gold is the purest gold that we calculate in the world. It's called 24 carat gold. You know, they got different carats of gold. They got 22 carat gold. They got 20. They got 14. They got 10 carat gold. Now, all of the carats of a gold are dependent upon the purity of the gold. The purest gold we have in the world, they call it 24 carat gold. Uh, and it's a very bright yellow. But did you know they've got gold in heaven that is so pure that it is transparent? The streets are made of transparent gold. So this is what I want to talk about. In the earth, we have 24 karat gold, but in heaven, they have gold so pure, you can look through it like it's glass, and it's beautiful, it's amazing. Well, that's divine gold. We don't have that kind of gold. Man can't make that kind of gold. It's the same thing with the holiness of God. The holiness of God is such a holiness that it is such a purity, a blazing, consuming purity, that it is beyond the capacity of man to ever attain it. Now, if you go back into the days of the Reformation, Martin Luther, those old priests in Catholicism, they tried to make themselves holy. And that's why they built monasteries up in the mountains, and they would beat themselves, and they would uh, climb up uh, uh, stairs on their knees until they were bloody. They would, they would whip each other. I mean, they did crazy stuff. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to uh, beat the, the, the immorality out of themselves. Uh, it can't be done. Uh, I realize we, we, we spank children. I understand that when they're real little because the Bible says that uh, spare the rod and uh, you spoil the child. Uh, and, 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 and the devil's got to be driven out of them. But it doesn't completely drive the devil out of them because if we could drive the devil uh, out of somebody by beating them, I would have a bunch of whipping posts up here, and, and we could be beating each other every night until there was no devil left in us. Any of you want to try it? <laughs> it don't work, man. But there is a way that we can come into such a purity, uh, such a cleansing, such a sanctification where Christ, his glory, will be manifested on us. And Moses, he, 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 was, he, he, he had spent so much time with God, the glory of God would shine upon him so strong that people could not stand to look at him, and he'd have to put a veil over his face. I mean, that's how strong the glory of God was on him. 
And I, I'm telling you, the glory is there, only there in the holy vessel. Now remember, when Moses first saw the fire burning in the bush, the Bible says he, he walked up to the bush, and a voice came out, and an angel spoke and said, you're standing on holy ground, take off the shoes. He took off the shoes, and he stepped on the holy ground. <clears throat> the, the more time you spend in the holy presence of God, the, the greater purification that will happen. And I think that's one reason why the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together, and even so much the more as you see the day approaching, the more you will... Uh, you're under the, 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 the influence of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, uh, the holiness of God. You know, it's just like uh, fragrances. I, I went up to, uh, I have a place where I keep single men, and I went up there today uh, to do some things. And when I left there, I had to get home and wash my hands. It smelled like tobacco, uh, smoking, because they smoke up there. And it got on my flesh, and you could smell it. Um, you know what? You hang around the world, and they're going to smell the world on you, honestly. Uh, whoever you hang around with, that's what you're going to end up smelling like. Um, and so if we spend time with God, you're going to be able to smell the presence of God. If you spend time with the devil, guess what you're going to smell like? You smell like the devil, man, right? I mean, whatever you hang around, well, I don't like smelling like the devil. Well, why? How come you're hanging around with him? Um, but anyway, so uh, here... Here, um, Isaiah is, he says in verse 5, Then said I, because now he's seen the holiness of God. Notice the very first thing that has to happen. Woe is on to me, for I'm a man on clean lips, because I, uh, because, uh, uh, he said, woe is on me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, un, of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So it, true holiness can only begin in the heart of a man or a woman once they see their filthiness and their wickedness. Now that is strange stuff. I mean, I've got, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures for that tonight. True holiness can only begin once we recognize how filthy and wicked and lost we are done. Now, it tells us this throughout the whole Bible, the New Testament and the New Testament. And, and actually, I just want to go there because I'll be, well, I'm born again, I'm washed in the blood, I'm, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm good, I'm good to go, I'm all right, there ain't nothing wrong with me. Well, is that what God says? What, don't misunderstand me now. When you got born again, God forgave you of all your sins, of your sins that you repented of, that you've knownly committed. But let me give you, I think a wonderful example is the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, they were God's people, but remember, they were slaves. They were slaves of Pharaoh, weren't they? And in the midst of them being slaves for Pharaoh, they were corrupted by idolatry. Uh, the children of God actually became idolaters. They began to worship the same gods the Egyptians worshipped. Uh, they ate the same food. They lived the same lifestyle. So God, the holy God of, uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, says to Moses, Moses, I'm going to send you down, and you're going to deliver them, first of all, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And so by mighty signs and wonders, he goes down and says, I am that I am, the holy God. He's a holy God. And that's actually the first time that God revealed himself as being holy in Exodus chapter 3. And so what does he do? By mighty signs and wonders, he brings them out of Egypt. Then what does he do? He brings them to the Red Sea. Now, there's nowhere else they can go because the army of Pharaoh is right behind them and the Red Sea is before them and they cross of, they go across the Red Sea on dry land by miracle. There's no way they could have ever done it in themselves. They could have never built a bridge across the Red Sea. I mean, God splits the Red Sea with a mighty wind. They walk across dry side land. They had to do it by faith. And the Bible says that when the Egyptians tried to do the same, God let the waves come back down and destroyed them all. Here's the thing. That's the new birth. We, we all got across the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, by faith. We accept Christ, we believe in Christ, we acknowledge Christ, we give our heart to Christ, we're born again. Now, we end up in the wilderness. 
Now remember, we're no longer in Egypt. Egypt really no longer has a right to us. We are in the wilderness. Actually, that wilderness is, in the Hebrew, it's spelled S-I-N-N, the wilderness of sin. So in the wilderness of sin now, God has taken them there because he's going to have to do something with them now. He's going to have to purge them, cleanse them, and purify them. Uh, that's what we're talking about. He, he need, there needs to be a transformation now, you know, because their thoughts, their lifestyles, their actions, their words, their mannerism, it's all Egyptian. He's got, see, he's got them out of Egypt. Now he's got to get Egypt out of them. So when he gets them out in Egypt, they begin to come under pressure. There's no water. There's no food. So what does God do? He, God's got to teach them, and this is all a process of purification. God's got to teach them that uh, they need to look to him. It's got to be by faith. This, this is all by faith, okay? So he's got to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He's got to teach them not to worship the golden calf. He's got to teach them not to grumble, not to gripe, not to complain, not to find fault. He's got to teach them to respect the word of God and the minister of God. He's got to teach them to be led by the fire by night and the cloud by day. I mean, there's a whole process. They're, they're, but here's the problem. The first generation, they came through the Red Sea, but they said, we, we, you know what? We'd rather go back to Egypt. <laughs> we, we don't, you know, now God wanted to get them into the promised land. Now people say, well, the promised land, Jordan is going over to heaven. No, it's not. Because once they went over Jordan 40 years later, they had the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, uh, the Clintonites, and the Abominites. No, <laughs> no. Anyways, they had they had the ites. They had the ites. They had to deal with, and so uh, that wilderness experience was for them to be purged, cleansed, and purified. But here's the problem: What if you think you're okay? I mean, if you think your attitude's okay, if you think what you believe is okay, if you think your lifestyle okay, and you go, well, I accepted Jesus, you're not going to be able to do a lot with a person who doesn't see uh, where they desperately need help. And this is the church. Now, we're not talking about the sin, we're talking about the church. So in Revelation chapter 3, God is speaking, Jesus is speaking to the church of the Laodiceans, and um, he says, uh, in verse 12, of course, he said, He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my, my name and, and uh, uh, write upon him my new name. But if you look here in verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So the very first thing God's trying to establish is saying, Listen, I'm not a liar, I'm not a deceiver, I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. How many of you know the flesh don't like the truth? Okay, so he said, I'm going to tell you, I'm the faithful and true, I'm not a liar, I'm going to tell you the truth. Verse 15, I know thy works. So today there's a lot of people who are attacking any kind of teaching when you talk about works. But God says, I know thy works. And I know he said, by their fruits you'll know them, but also by their works you'll know them. So if I, if I lie, I'm a liar. If I steal, I'm a thief. If I'm committing adultery, I'm an adulterer, right? Uh, if I put anything greater than Christ, I'm an idolater. And he says, listen to what he says here. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, now, a lot of people stop there, but he's going to explain what he means by this. He's going to tell us exactly what he's talking about. Because, how do you know someone's lukewarm? Not us, but God says, I know you're lukewarm because of your works, and here's the evidence of it. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. So that 
If you have the attitude, I'm okay, I'm all right, nothing wrong with me, that means you will never attain holiness because you don't see your need for it. I mean, we could really talk about this. There's so many scriptures dealing with this. Did you know that the saints of the old and the new, we'll see this in a moment, they had a recognize, they had a recognition of their spiritual condition. Peter, remember when Jesus had Peter throw the net into the water after he taught on his boat, and he caught this amazing catch of fish. And the first thing that Peter did, listen, the first thing that Peter did, he fell on his face weeping, broken. He says, Lord, depart from me. I am a wicked man. Now, the modern-day church would say, oh, don't say such a thing, Peter. No, no. Peter, standing in the presence of Christ, who was holiness manifested in the flesh, saw, saw. Now, one thing Peter did, he saw that, that amazing miracle because, see, they were under the belief system that God doesn't hear sinners. That's what they truly believed. So when there were si mighty signs and wonders, they would go, wow, you've got to be a holy man. Notice, where holiness is manifested, he said, yeah, but pastor, what about those who will say, Lord, we did many for wonderful works in thy name. Depart from your work as the wicked I never knew. Oh, oh, don't misunderstand me. You can have faith in Christ and get some results. But I am talking about amazing miracles where Jesus walked on the water. He filled the fishing boat in the daytime when he threw the net into the water. Great fish. So many they had to get another boat to come alongside. Uh, he turned the water into wine. He opened up all the blind eyes and cleansed all the lepers and raised the dead. And remember when the blind man, he opened his eyes and they took him and they said, who did this? Who did this? And he says, well, you know, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, how did he do it? Well, he said, well, he, he must be a holy man. And they said, who are you to say he was holy? You were born in sin. He says, no, wait a minute. We know that God doesn't hearken to the voice of sinners like this. And, and they threw him out of the temple, threw him out of the synagogue. Well, see, that's what I'm saying is that Peter knew he was a holy man. And he cries out, he said, oh, you convict me of sin. See, that's what Isaiah did. He said, oh, woe with me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So he says, because <clears throat> you're in bad, bad condition, as a believer, let alone sinners, let alone those who haven't come through the Red Sea, when you don't acknowledge you're a, you're a mess without God. So notice what he says here. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. God said, that's how I see you. He's talking to the church. He ain't talking to the sinner. And that's why they're lukewarm, because they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, they're not desperate, they're not pressing in, they're not taking a hold. Paul said, I press toward the mark. Now, verse 18, though, Christ doesn't leave us in that condition. He said, I counsel that he buy of me, me, Jesus, gold. What? Tried in fire. What is that gold? It's holiness. How, how can I buy holiness? Well, um, yes, you can buy holiness, and we're going to be talking about that. By faith, by obedience, by hunger. It says that thou mayest be rich. And listen, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness uh, do not appear and anoint thine eye with eye salve, that's the anointing, that thou mayest see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will what? Sup with him, and he with me. Now, Jesus told us, eat his flesh and drink his blood, and we have no life in us. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sit down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith on the churches. So not everybody is going to be willing to hear this. I understand this. So as we're teaching and touching and ministering on this aspect of holiness, um, 
I realize this ain't going to be for everybody because every, a lot of people say, ah, I, I, I'm rich, I'm full, and I have need of nothing, and they won't recognize it. And because they won't recognize they need the holiness of God, they need to be purified, they need to be cleansed, they need to be purged, they need to go through the fire, they need to be sanctified, um, they will never really walk in garments of pure white. They will never really experience the glory of God. They will never really experience what God wants to do. Um, so let me just give you some scriptures. Job said he was a righteous man. Job proclaimed his righteousness when he lost everything. He thought it was God that took it, but God finally showed up in chapter uh, 40 and 41. And when God finally shows up and he begins to deal with the heart of Job, listen what Job did in verse chapter 42, verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Listen, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. See, the way up is what? The way down. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, hey, listen, if you want to be, low, if you want to be master, you've got to become servant of all. It's amazing because, and it says this in the book of James, and let's take a look there because this really is dealing with the foundation. If you're going to begin to assimilate holiness, if you're going to begin to be purged and purified and cleansed, um, you're going to have to get this attitude. And, and it's not make-believe, it's not imitation, it's not fake. Uh, one time I, I had a guy that I had started a church in Hagerstown, and I put this man over this church. He was an evangelist. And, uh, one, cause, and I would always say this, hey, every answer to prayer I get is in spite of me. <laughs> it's not because of me, it's in spite of me. All the good things that God has done is in spite of me. And one day he got in my face and he accused me of having a false humility. I didn't argue with him. See, because we... The modern-day church seems to teach people to brag and to boast about how righteous they are. I'm not righteous in me. My righteousness is as filthy rags. God's righteousness is amazing. Yes, he was made sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There's a process of being made into it. There's a purification See, when you get born again, I believe that God drops you into that furnace. And he wants to purify you. And that furnace is, is not just tests and trials and tribulations. Um, there's a lot of things involved in this, and we hope to touch on that in the next couple of weeks. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm doing this message, really, because I need to attain, I need, I need some purification. <laughs> I need some cleansing. I need some purging. I need some refining. Now, I'm not saying none of you need it, but I need it. And, uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe only three, uh, three of us out of all of those that are here tonight really need purging. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, so... In James chapter five, in James chapter four, he's talking to the church. He says, "Listen, it says, uh, do not you think that the Scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy?" And he said, "But he, God giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, listen, God resisteth the proud. I'm rich, I'm full, I have need of nothing, but giveth grace unto the humble." Oh, God, I'm wretched, I'm poor, I'm blind, I'm naked, and I'm destitute. Oh, God, help me. So God says he's going to give grace to those who admit their poverty. Lord, I admit I, I'm so needy. I am absolutely bankrupt without you. So God's going to give you grace, so you can be happy about that. Then he says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And he's talking to the believers in Christ. Purify your heart, you what? Double-minded. So that's probably most of our problem there is we, we're double-minded. And what does that mean? Is we get, yeah, we, our mind is are in heaven, but our mind is also on the earth. I mean, you really can't go two directions at once. You can't love God and mammon, the Bible says. 
You can't, you can't go, I'm, I can't go left and right. You know, and, and, and the more I'm able to do that, the more painful it gets. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, it's going to rip you in half. I mean, you're going to be tormented. How, how, can you, how can you live righteous and live unrighteous? How can you run into the light and yet stay in the darkness? I mean, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it doesn't work. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, he's going to reap. Flesh, flesh, spirit, spirit. So that's what James is talking about in James chapter 4. And it says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned and mourn. Join the heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Uh, and then he says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. For he that speaketh evil, his brother judges his brother. Speaketh evil little law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not doer the law, but a judge. Who art thou that judges another? And what that's talking about, you'll find out that whenever we're operating in self-righteousness and conceit, <clears throat> we'll be critical of others. I'm okay, you're not okay. You're a mess and I'm not a mess. Uh, who do you think you are? Instead of praying for people, we'll find ourselves attacking people. <laughs> I, I, I did that a little bit today. <laughs> Lord, help <laughs> I, I'm sure none of the rest of you hundred out here did that, but I did that. <laughs> none of you thousands out there did that, but I did that. I, uh, I'm needy. Um, so what do you do? Do you just do what Judas did? Go hang yourself? No, no, no. You do what Peter did after he betrayed Christ. He fell on his face and cried out for repentance. There's so many scriptures dealing with this. So Job said, I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, so Job abhorred himself. Now, what part of us do we abhor? The part that, that God is working in? No, no. The part of us that is contrary to the will of God. Um, Isaiah 41, 14, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and I redeemer the whole of Israel. So God called um, Jacob a worm. People say, I'm not a worm. Oh, I, uh, compared to God? Compared to God? You know, you always got to be a worm before you, can become a, before you can become a butterfly. I mean, so it's always a worm before it's a butterfly. We call it a caterpillar, but it's a worm. And so if I'm going to become a butterfly and I'm going to rise up on the wings of the spirit, I've got to recognize I'm a worm. Without Christ, I can do nothing. Um, and we need to see our desperate need for holiness, um, that you can't live without it. God, I need to be holy. God, I want to be holy. God, I want to be sanctified, set apart, purified. I, I, I want to be purged. Um, it's self-loathing hating everything within us that is contrary to the personality of God, don't you? Is there anybody here that hates that part of you that's against the will of God, the nature of God, the character of God? Well, listen, uh, rejoice that you do because there's a lot of people in the modern-day church who absolutely believe they're okay, they're all right, and they have need of nothing. That's why they don't even come to the house of God no more. That's why they don't read their Bible. That's why they don't pray. Now, some people, people can do it out of religiosity or tradition, or they're trying to work for their salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm telling you what, without the Bible, I'd be gone. Without Christ, I would have been dead. Without God's mercy, I have no hope. John 12, 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. This is the first foundation. You've got to recognize he's holy and you're not and you need him. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're, pliant, you're, 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 you're uh, naked uh, without him. Matthew 5, 1. And, and this is the Beatitudes. Now this is actually, this, this is the very first teaching that Jesus did and we'll pick up here tomorrow night on this, but Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went on their mountains, listen to this now, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. 
So this wasn't for everybody. This is for his disciples. That means those who have forsaken everything are now following him. They want to be where he's at. So he's going to give this teaching not to the multitudes. Now, he's healing the multitudes. He's feeding the multitudes. He's delivering the multitudes. He's casting the devils out of them, but he's not giving them this teaching. Why? They couldn't handle it. This isn't for everybody. This is for those who want to go further. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, listen, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is he talking about? He's not talking about financial poverty here. Uh, even though in James it says, Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love them? So having faith doesn't mean you're going to have things because it takes faith to say, I'm not going to attain things. I don't care about things. That doesn't mean you take a vow of poverty. That means you use faith to say, no, I could get that, but I'm not getting that. I could have that, but I'm not having that. I could go there, but I'm not going there. Why? Because I need Jesus. I need God. I need to follow the Lord. And so this is the foundation, the very first step. If we are going to acquire divine holiness as God has it, We've got to see our spiritual poverty. Then the very next thing he says in the Beatitudes, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. Notice, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The, the, the mourning there that we're talking about is not feeling sorry for yourself, you know, sucking your thumb and filling your diapers. Poor me, squalling and bawling like a newborn calf in a tin barn roof on a cold winter night. <laughs> Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Oh, I'm about to just die. No, it's saying you're, you're, you're broken, your heart. Remember, the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus said, is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the what? To the poor. You know why? They're the only ones who are going to listen to it. Those who recognize their spiritual poverty will listen to the gospel. Those who think they're okay, they're all right, nothing's wrong with me. Yeah, but now I'm born again, Pastor Mike. Well, let me tell you this. The deeper you go in Christ, the closer you get to Christ, the more you will recognize how far you really are from him. Not that you're not born again. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for instance, uh, and when I was young growing up, I did a lot of work on a farm. You go, at the end of the day, the sun is setting, you go into the bathroom, you're standing in front of the, the mirror, you're so tired, you don't even want to turn on a light, right? So you're washing your hands, and you maybe splash your face, and you finally get enough energy to flip on the light, and the brighter the light, the more you recognize the dirty you are. <laughs> you're dirty. I remember my wife, and when she eats spaghetti, she gets it all over her face. And there's been times, uh, God forgive me, that we'd eat spaghetti, and she'd have spaghetti all over her face, and I wouldn't tell her. And she'd walk around all day long with spaghetti on her face until she got home and went in front of the mirror to get ready for bed. And she said, honey, how come you didn't tell me I had spaghetti on my face? She needed somebody to tell her. She didn't know it. How many know your eyes don't pop out of your head and look back at your face? You don't know. Well, Guess what? We need somebody to tell us we're not where we need to be. I mean, I mean, speaking the truth in love. I mean, through the years, godly people and even ungodly people try to tell me I had dirt on my face and I didn't believe them. Whew, man, told me there was something wrong with me. Now, there's people who are going to tell you there's something wrong with you because there's something wrong with them. But how I many you know it, it doesn't take near as much spirituality to see what's wrong with someone else than it is to see what's wrong with you? It oh, man, to see what's wrong with you? Wow. That takes God, doesn't it? I, I remember, and I tell this story, that for years my wife and kids would tell me there was things wrong with me, and I just wouldn't live with it. Listen, I just... You know, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know, really, honestly, I rebuke you, and you put your fingers up like a cross. You know, I rebuke you. I don't believe it. There ain't nothing wrong with me. And one day I finally went to the Lord, and I said, 
and I had a piece of paper in front of me, and I just ran across the list the other day. And I had a pen, and I thought, okay, God, is there anything wrong with me? And I mean, I couldn't believe it. God began to talk to me. He began, I, I, I knew there were some things wrong, but you know what? Before I knew it, I had filled up a whole page, and I went, oh, God, <laughs> I'm such a mess. He said, no, there ain't no, that ain't no surprise to me. <laughs> I always knew you were a mess. You know, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So there's so many scriptures dealing with this. Um, Isaiah 4, 6. But we, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Like the, the Bible says, we're like a leaf that the wind just takes us away. The Bible says the heavens themselves are filthy before God. How much more man that drinketh iniquity like it's water? Uh, Matthew, uh, we'll close here in a minute, but Matthew 7, 7, he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone ask, asketh, receive it, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And we're talking about wanting the holiness of God, the purity of God, the sanctification of God, the purging, the fire of heaven. What happened on the day of Pentecost, and we'll get into this tomorrow night, talking about the second aspect of being filled with the holiness of God is, first of all, you recognize how far you really are from God, and you're open to let God show you. And then the second aspect is now you must begin to hunger and thirst after it. Okay, God, I thought I was clean, but I need a bath. I, I, thought, I, was, I thought I was okay, but I see I'm not. And in, in every aspect of the word, in how you talk, how you walk, how you live, how you dress, how you act, how you treat people, how you treat your families, what you do with your free time, what you do with your finances. I mean, all of this has got to be given to God. I mean, it's a process, man. It's like going through a furnace. And he said that. He said, I will, I will refine you seven times over like the purest gold and the purest silver. You know, God wants to make us like that transparent gold upon the streets of Jerusalem in this life. Yes, the next it will happen, boom. I mean, in the minute I see Jesus, he says he's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. Why? We're going to be weeping because how far we really have been from him. Now, you know, I'm not talking about being saved. What I'm talking about is becoming a possessor of the holiness of God. Can you say amen? Okay, Michael. Stephen, are you still back there? <laughs>